Hello again everyone from Tokyo, Japan and welcome back to Japan Vintage Camera. It's an absolutely beautiful summer day here in Tokyo. Uh, this is the last day of August and uh, we're going to be looking at the beautiful autumn season pretty soon. I'm kind of sad to see the summer go by and you kind of know that the summer is ending when the sound of the uh, semi-sans or the cicadas or cicadas, however you pronounce it, stops. Uh, if you listen in the background, there's no sound of insects where last month if I were sitting on this spot making a video It would be too noisy for you meet for you to hear me uh, So uh, summer is definitely winding down and the autumn season is coming uh, This was an especially nice summer especially the latter half of August because uh, festivals have returned to Japan uh, a lot of uh, parts around Japan canceled their summer festivals for obvious reasons. And here in Roppongi, our last summer festival uh, prior to the pandemic was in uh, August of 2019. And last week they finally held a, a new festival after uh, some four years without and of course I had to make sure to go there even though I, I had a really busy weekend and was quite tired I, I had to get over to the festival and uh, take a look around listen to the music and have a little bit of uh, a dance around the circle. Uh, Roppongi is a very kind of central part of Tokyo, a very international kind of place. There's not much of traditional Japan uh, around here, uh, but still the summer festival is quite a draw and we get a lot of people who are non-Japanese who dress up and come uh, to take part and uh, yeah, it's a real blast. The good thing about the festival is that the, the singing is live, even though a lot of the music is recorded, but most of the stuff that they do is live. Whereas if you go to like the really small festivals in the small neighborhoods in the suburbs, uh, it's pretty much just a, a stand with a drum and two people beating on the drum and someone playing music to a boom box and there's some cheap lights strung around and people uh, you know, dancing around the stand. Regardless of how big or small the festival is, it's a lot of fun. And if you come to uh, Japan in uh, late July or through the month of August, I, I recommend you just wander around and just listen for the sound of drums and flutes. And that usually means there's a festival nearby. Just find your way toward it and, uh, and go ahead and take part. Uh, the locals, no matter where they happen to be, they, they want as many people as possible to join their festival. And uh, you know, even if you are not Japanese, uh, they're quite happy to, to have you join in. But anyway, uh, that's a really long introduction here, so let's go ahead and get started with the subject of today's video. And today I'm going to be talking about what is called a toy camera in Japan, or toy camera. And um, this particular camera that I'm going to be describing is the Fuji Pet 35. Now, uh, in the years immediately after the war, when uh, people in Japan had very little money, uh, toy cameras were quite popular. They were very cheap and inexpensive and shot inexpensive film. And uh, economic times were quite, or, uh, you know, economic times were very tough. And so uh, there was a pretty good market for these cameras in those days. But as soon as the economy began to get going again, uh, people kind of dumped the toy cameras and started buying real cameras because Japan was producing quite a, a variety of good stuff. And in recent years, the toy cameras have made kind of a comeback. There's a kind of a, I don't know, a retro resurgence. A lot of people have some nostalgia of the, of the 40s and early 50s. And, and here in Japan, there are a lot of people who, uh, from that era who are still with us. And so uh, prices on those uh, kind of cheap toy cameras of that era have gone up. Uh, Fuji, when they introduced their toy camera, and this particular version was released in 1959, uh, decided to build a, what was called a toy camera, but was actually a very high quality camera. Uh, the only thing that you know, re makes it resemble a toy camera is its construction, which is mostly plastic, and the, the use of aluminum top and bottom covers instead of brass, which was what was used in most other cameras of the time. Uh, the photographic quality of the, the normal uh, toy cameras, like the Sakura or Suteki or other cameras of the 1940s, was not very high. But people weren't picky back then, so you know, it, it wasn't a big deal. But by the late 1950s, there were, people expected more performance, even from a toy camera. And Fuji delivered a, a very high quality lens with this camera. Uh, this 45mm f3.5 lens, which was capable of taking excellent photos. So you had... Uh, a really inexpensive camera with a high quality lens which could take really nice photographs. The cool thing about this camera is its complete absolute simplicity. If you want just a nuts and bolts camera with no frills, no bells or whistles or anything, just something which uses the basic photographic principles to take a camera, a camera like this is a really good choice. Basically this is just a a, a light box with a lens on the front with a, a variety of aperture and shutter speeds and a simple winding and film counting mechanism and a rewind knob to rewind the film when you're done. It doesn't get any more simple than a camera like this. So 
Let's go ahead and take a look at the features, controls, and functions, and how to use the Fuji Pet. And starting at the top here, I'm going to start in the middle this time. And uh, we have a viewfinder in the middle, lined up precisely in the center. And that makes the camera easier to uh, use for uh, composing your image. Pretty much what you see through the viewfinder you're going to find on the film. Whereas uh, some other uh, cameras with, you know, the system they are designed with, they usually have, you know, particularly rangefinder systems, the viewfinder is offset to the left, which means a, a somewhat, um, you, know, you have to be careful when you are adjusting for parallax and such as you focus to the, on things far away and up close. When the viewfinder is set right in the center, the only parallax you have to worry about is vertical, just a little bit. And in the case of this camera, the, the close focusing distance isn't all that close. So whatever you're going to see through the viewfinder is probably going to be in focus. Uh, we have two identical looking knobs on the top, except one says wind and one says rewind. And it's pretty self-explanatory what they do. Uh, the rewind knob, of course, has an arrow here telling you which way you turn it to rewind the film. And the wind, of course, has the same thing. But the wind has a, a clutch in it which prevents you from winding it in the wrong direction. Moving to the back of the camera, we have a, a, re, a release lever here. And this camera works kind of like some of the 120 folding uh, film cameras of the 40s and 50s, the ones which had uh, built-in uh, film counters. As you wind the film and it goes to the next frame, this lever will lock uh, the, the film so that the, the, the frame is lined up behind the lens and you take a photograph and then to move to the next uh, exposure, you have to hit the release lever and then wind to the next uh, exposure and so on and so on. As you do that, there's a frame counter window here on the top which goes up to 36 exposures and allows you to see how many exposures you have left. It's about as simple as it gets and the good thing about this simplicity is that it's very seldom breaks or goes wrong. Uh, this camera I got in a box full of other cameras sitting way at the bottom and it's, it, this thing probably hasn't been uh, used since, I don't know, uh, Kennedy was president. And uh, I took it out of the box and blew the dust off of it and it still works fine. On the back here we have nothing but this uh, metal film door and uh, the name tag on the back, Fuji Photo Film Company, made in Japan. On the bottom here we have a standard quarter inch tripod socket. On this side here we have this uh, dial and the release uh, lever for opening the film door. This dial is what you use to, as a reminder for what film you have loaded in the camera. It doesn't have any uh, effect on the operation of the camera, it's just a reminder. Uh, they hadn't kind of standardized uh, film boxes or things like that, so cameras of this uh, age don't have a, uh, a holder for the film card in the back. They usually have a dial somewhere that you turn to remind you what kind of film you have loaded in the camera. And uh, you know, you, you just turn it until it lines up. You can line it up with the, the arrow here on the release lever. So if I have, say, uh, say Fuji Presta loaded in this, I would set it to 400, and uh, whenever I look at the camera, I know it's in it, except that this turns a little bit easy. To open the film door, you have to turn it to where the red open uh, name lines up with this chrome tab, and simply pull it up like so, and that opens the film door. And I'm looking through the back of this. It's a wonderful, wonderfully clean and clear lens. By the late 1950s, uh, Fuji was making their own lenses, and they were quite high quality, good quality glass and good quality uh, designs and manufacturing. Meant, you know, the, even a simple camera like the Fuji Pet 35 could take amazing photos. Loading the film is quite simple. You simply pull up on the rewind knob like so, and drop in your film cartridge, push it back down to lock it in place. And I love it. Even on this simple camera, it has detents to hold it in the right position. And you pull the film leader over and uh, insert it into the slot here on the take-up spool and then simply wind the camera until the film is pulled across and the holes on the top of the film engage in the take-up spool here. And it, it, or I can't say it's a spool, it's actually just a sprocket on this camera. Uh, one thing to, re to remember that when you're operating this camera without film, the winding mechanism is not going to work. You have to have film inside the camera for it to pull uh, the, the cog here to operate the winding mechanism. Otherwise, you know, it, it's not going to operate. And then you can see pretty much every time it winds a full frame, uh, it uh, locks the uh, uh, release lever here and the film counter moves up one exposure. Now, when you're loading the film in the camera, you have to reset this manually, the film counter. So you simply turn it with your finger until the red S is showing up, and S is for start. When you put in the film, you simply wind it and use the release lever until the number one is showing, and the camera is ready to go. 
Now, the important uh, features and functions of this camera are located on the front. In the very front, we have the focusing ring, which is a beautiful machined aluminum ring, which has a wonderful feel to it. It feels like a very high quality uh, piece here. It's not hard to turn, it's not easy to turn. It's really, really smooth. Around the focusing ring, we have a focusing uh, distance scale, which is arranged in meters. And this is a scale focus camera. You have to look at what you're taking a photograph of and guess the uh, focusing distance. For example, behind the camera here, there's a, a tree and that's maybe five meters away. So I would set the focusing ring to five meters and it should be in focus. Uh, behind the focusing ring, we have the ring which you use to adjust the shutter speeds. And we have a range of bulb and one quarter of a second up to one two hundredth of a second. This is pretty much the same shutter which uh, was uh, put on early twin lens reflex cameras like the old Ricoflex uh, models. And then behind that we have an aperture uh, indicator which is uh, adjusted by turning this tab on the bottom. And we have an aperture range from f3.5 to f22. Uh, to charge the shutter, you push down on the left side just a little bit until it clicks and the shutter release button is held up and to fire the shutter simply push down that lever there and it takes a photograph. The cool thing about this camera is that it features a, uh, a socket here for a standard cable release. Now, a camera like this, you might think that it's not useful for much because it's just too basic, but a camera like this is actually a really wonderful tool for, uh, say, something like street or candid photography. Uh, first, it's kind of small and compact, and it has a low profile. Second, it looks like a toy, and people aren't sure what you're actually doing with it. As long as it doesn't look like a gun or a professional camera, they're probably not going to be afraid at you, of you if you point it at them. And if you set up uh, a camera like this just right, you can take photographs uh, much more quickly than with many other kinds of cameras. So uh, when I, whenever I go out shooting, I always try to choose days which have uh, good light or times of day which have good light. Uh, normally I like to shoot uh, Fuji Presto or Kodak Tri-X film, which, uh, which is a 400 speed film. And I just do a kind of basic preset when I'm shooting this film. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and I'll set the aperture, say between, or, you know, around f8. And I'll set my shutter speed to about one one hundredth of a second. And then I'll preset my focus. And if I want to shoot at people, uh, say around three, uh, three meters or so, or between three and five meters, uh, if I want to get, say, like their whole body in there, or if I'm just trying to get you know, a picture of them from, say, the, you know, the, the waist up, then about half that far. And all I have to do is simply wind the film and uh, charge the shutter, and I'm ready to take a photograph. It's extremely simple. I don't have to focus. I don't have to fumble with any controls. It's preset. I just point the camera, take the photograph like so, uh, wind it, and the camera's ready to take another photograph just that fast. And this camera is incredibly quiet. It, it, you know, it's much quieter than any kind of uh, uh, rangefinder camera or other leaf sh shutter camera. It makes almost no sound. And yeah, it, it's just a wonderful tool for that kind of photography. But anyway, I was getting to be a longer video than I expected and it's, it's really uh, kind of silly to make a really long video about such a simple camera. So I'll go ahead and uh, cut it short now. I'll be listing this camera for sale in my Etsy store shortly. I have a couple of online stores where I sell vintage Japanese cameras. So if you like this camera or looking for another vintage Japanese camera, please visit one of my stores. I'll post links to my stores in the description below the video. Uh, for those of you who are regular watchers, you'll probably notice that I've been uh, posting more videos recently since I've returned from America. And I tend to continue doing this until the ski season comes up. Uh, if you'd like to see these videos, uh, please subscribe. And if you like the video, uh, please like it. Uh, that, uh, that helps us out a lot here and uh, we really appreciate it. Anyway, thank you very much for watching and I hope you tune in again soon.